Bobby Savage, everyone. So we've been in this series uh, that started out last week called the One Mediator Between God and Men. And that's what it says in First Timothy. We only have one being that stands between us and the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. There's a reason why we chose this for the title. There's been trouble in the churches, specifically this church that we had contact with and we were being fed by the sermons. Unfortunately, we came in at a time when great division had settled in and whole congregations were walking out. One of the scriptures that the principal minister that used or uses as part of his doctrine to explain why he believes that the father, it was the father rather, that was interacting with ancient Israel, is in Hebrews 1, uh, Hebrews 1 uh, and verse 1 is where we'll start. And I'll show you how this is very erroneous. It's, it's wrong. And it's a shame. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. That's true. At many times and in various ways. But in these last days, this is what he uses to segregate, he has spoken to us by his son. Now that simply means that it was time, at a time that was right, at a time when it was of God the Father's choosing that the Son would come <coughs> in person, right? Because he had to come in person to die. So, <clears throat> But then when you read on, it starts to link up with the rest of the narrative that doesn't support this Father only talking with the Israelites uh, uh, doctrine. Anyway, but in the last days he has spoken to us by his son, that's true, whom he appointed heir of all things. What does that mean? And through whom he made the universe. He made the universe through this being. And the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now here's something to take note of. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Because that's what he was. He was the being who said, let there be light. And then something as powerful as the sun appeared. And if we study the power behind the sun, it blows our mind. It's incredible power. Well, he said that with one word, let there be light. So then what it says here, that sustaining all things by his powerful word, you better believe it. This is who we're dealing with. So, when people read this, they understand that when the master or the king was working through their representative, there was no option to approach the one who appointed a designate, especially if this designate was his son. And that's what I'm trying to point out. Anybody could try to say anything they want, but the, does the narrative support it? When you read your scriptures like you should, it doesn't support the fact that the Father dealt with humankind one-on-one -on -one because we need to be redeemed, and it was only one who could redeem us. A penalty had to be paid, and he brought that payment, the peace through that payment by his blood. Does it make sense that the Father would mess with that? something that was set up as a part of his own plan, that this being called the Word or the Logos would be slain from the creation of the world. Does it make sense that he would uh, contradict that? No, it doesn't. And, and we'll get to those other scriptures. So he uses that scripture, and it's very weak. But this, this puts it to bed right here. If we go to Peter, this explains a little further some of the dynamic of using the prophets and how they were used, right? Because even angels were used. Yeah. And there's scriptures there to support that. <clears throat> so, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Right? Peter says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you. Well, what these guys did was they searched 
They searched the uh, intently and with the greatest of care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them, wow, right? The Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings uh, of Christ and the glories that would follow. Right? So that tells you a little bit more there about what was being quoted here in Hebrews. That in old times, yes, God did work through those prophets. This is how he did it. And again, we find Christ. The Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when the predict when he predicted the sufferings, speaking primarily of Isaiah, of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, and this is incredible, but they were serving you. Who's the you they're talking about? When they spoke of these things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit, again, the Spirit of Christ, His Son, sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Right? Verse 18, let's go a little further. Verse 18 here, of the, of the uh, uh, first Peter. Verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed or bought from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. There's a way that seems right to us. That's what the Bible says. But in the end, those ways will only lead to death. The Bible also says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge because they're not, they don't know. They're unaware. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do, not to believe me, but to read these things for yourself because that's what's important. I'm nobody. Only a man can only lead you astray. Too many people put their faith in a man. And look what happens. Terrible things happen. This is for you. And if you have ears to hear, something is intriguing your ear. Read. Learn for yourself. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold. You were redeemed, bought back, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's how you were bought. That's how you were redeemed. He was chosen before the creation of the world. This was preordained. This was foretold that he would do this. But was revealed in these last times, and this is incredible, for your sake. <clears throat> for your sake. And that's why I keep asking for a long time now, who are you? What are you? What are you supposed to be? Who are you? Through him you believe in God. Who raised him. Through him you believe in God. Who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God, Christ Jesus. And I'll use other scriptures as we move forward here to prove that he's worthy of worship. The apostles worshipped him in the boat. The Magi, the wise men, when they came to see him, and they say there was three. The Bible's not clear. There was more than three. But anyway, that's a story for another day. But the Magi worshipped him. They worshipped him. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Magi worshipped him. They knew, they knew to whom they were approaching and to who they were speaking. And when they worshipped him, he was only a little boy. But they knew who that little boy was. <coughs> they knew who that little boy would become. And what he would do. It was a promise. So yeah, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 36. Starting in verse 36. And this is Jesus Christ speaking with his own mouth. Remember, the power of his word. And he still had that power when he was a human. 
although he was very much a man, and could have failed. Now Christ says in verse 36, I have testimony, I have things to say, that are weightier than that of John, John the Baptist. For the very work that the Father has given to me to finish, the Father gave him a job, the Father gave him this work. He was their representative to designate the word and the logos of the Godhead. And don't let that confuse you. You'll learn more and more about that as you read and as you go forward. These things will come into remembrance and you'll go, that's right. And you'll remember them. That's why it's important to read these things for yourself, to add to your knowledge. So for the very work that the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, right? testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. And then Christ went on to make it abundantly clear, not only to the Jews, to everyone. All scripture is profitable for reproof and for correction. You have never heard his voice, nor have you seen his form. So that God in the Old Testament, whose form uh, was, so, was seen, even the backside of him, that was not the Father. So says Jesus. And he, does, he doesn't just say it here. He says it in other areas. Because the same individual who's introduced this, this uh, uh, heres heresaical doctrine, right, is stating that, well, he was just talking with the Jews here. He didn't mean everybody. Some people saw the Father. No. Jesus Christ made a statement. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. And that's what's at stake here. Believing the one he sent, and believing that he was sent right from the beginning with a mission for mankind. And he was the Godhead's representative. As the word, the Logos, the spokesman. That was his job. And then he goes on to say, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you'll possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. And yet, you refuse to come to me to have life. That's what he wanted to give them. You refuse to come to me to have life. Very shocking. Very shocking. And then John chapter 1. You refuse to come to me to have life. In chapter, uh, verse 14, we were here last week, but this is very important. <coughs> oh, excuse me. A bit of a cold. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh. So now you know who the narrative is speaking of. Not God the Father. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. Right? This is an eyewitness statement. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only. Why is He making a point of saying that? One and only. Who came from the Father. He came from the Father, full of grace and truth, right from the beginning. Just as much as it was bound that he would have to come and die for our sins and redeem us to the Father and reveal the Father to us, this was also bound in this practice, the practice of his role, which was right from the beginning. That's it. That's it. Right? Full of grace and truth. And then if you go just quickly, keep your finger there in, in, uh, in John. Because right? I want to continue there. But go to Acts, Acts chapter 4, real quickly here. While we're on that thought, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Here's something amazing. It says, this is Peter, right? Salvation is found, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men as our only mediator 
by which we must be saved. That's it. Now, how do you insert the Father at that point, on any level, in any book of the Bible, in any way? You cannot. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven, given the men by which they must be saved. That's it. Jesus Christ, for us, our only mediator. Like I said, it's a narrative. It's a story. And all these components of the story tell you how it is and what it is. And no man can come along and deceive you. We'll read that scripture as well later. But going back to John, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, like I said, to keep your finger there. And in verse 15 it says, John, the Baptist, testified concerning him. And he cries out in a loud voice, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. He pre-existed before I was even in my mother's womb. He surpassed me because he's greater than me. I'll go on, I'll go on to explain that further. further. He was before him. And like Peter said, there is no other name under heaven. Now was that just for the disciples, the apostles? Or was that for all of them, the patriarchs and the prophets? There was, no, there was only one name under heaven for them as well. There was only one mediator for them as well. Jesus, not the Father. Right? The Father didn't do it in the Old Testament, and then Jesus took over in the New. That doesn't make sense. It's confusion. And it doesn't align itself with the narrative. So anyway, John says that he who comes after me right, has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, Jesus' grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Right? And here's the emphasis is on Moses. Not the Father. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one, and it goes on to make it very clear, no one has ever seen God but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. That's it. So when you got some man that's trying to insert that the Father dealt with us directly, he's blaspheming. He's twisting the scriptures, dangerously so. John says this, No one has ever seen God but God, the one and only. And then to be very clear about who this God, who has viewed God, the Godhead, the Father, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. That's his job. That's his role. Just as he made him known right from the beginning. He explained the laws to Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the garden. He spoke with them. He created them. He created them. He spoke with them. He walked with them. Yeah. And then back to, uh, yeah, back to uh, First John. And then if we go to uh, uh, chapter, or sorry, chapter 1. But verse 30 of chapter 1. <clears throat> John continues here and he says, This is the one that I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me or is greater than me because he was before me. I myself didn't know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. That's why. And then if we go to John 3 to continue what John the Baptist, his testimony about Christ was, because there's a lot of stuff in there that helps clear up this, this confusion. So John chapter 3 and verse 31. This is John the Baptist speaking now. He said the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. We were born of our parents. We were born of our mother's bodies. And we came into this world a little baby. 
an hour an adult people. There's a process. It's a circle of life. And John is saying, the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth. We were never anything more than what we are to this day, but physical beings. And speaks as one from the earth. There's a ceiling above us. There's a capacity to our ability, to our understanding, and to our ability to express. That can be enhanced by the Holy Spirit, but we're still human. We're still bound by physical laws. And then it goes on to say, the one who comes from heaven, the one, is above all. He testifies, right? He's the Word, He's the Logos, to what He has seen and heard. And here's something amazing. But no one accepts His testimony. They reject Him. Why? There's no room for my Word in you. Why? The man who has accepted it is a remarkable condition. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God for God. And he gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything, including our care and our communication, in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son and his role in what he says has eternal life. We just read, though, that the majority reject him. They don't have ears to hear it. It's just the sounds coming through, and they don't understand what those sounds mean. Some of us do, though. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son, this is what's at stake here, will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. And that's what's happening right now as we speak. And, and imagine that, especially coming into Passover, when we're renewing our covenant with Jesus Christ. And he's being eclipsed. He's being pushed aside. Wow. Wow. Let's go to verse 13 of John 3. These are again words of Christ right from his own mouth. <clears throat> we just heard John the Baptist's testimony. He who it went it was ahead of me is greater than me because he was before me. He pre-existed. John understood that. And here's Jesus. At verse 13 of chapter 3. No one has ever gone into heaven. No one has ever gone into heaven. We have millions of people that believe you go to heaven when you die or up. Jesus Christ in John chapter 3 verse 13 says, No one has ever gone into heaven except the Son of Man, the one who came from heaven. The one who came from heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, and that's a story you need to read as a sign, and when the people looked at that snake he lifted up, they were healed. Right? Because God had sent a deadly disease among them because of their sins. But just as right, Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. People have to look towards his death and remember that he died for their sins and accept that. That's all he's asking. That's all he's asking. And that everyone who believes in him they have eternal life. And then there's a very famous scripture. For God so loved the world that he decided to come down and speak to mankind by himself. It doesn't say that. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He didn't contradict him. He didn't step over him. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, in the words that he spoke with our forefathers, when he guided them and he liberated them out of slavery, which was going to be a mirror of what was to come, a more glorious exodus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son 
into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Very clear. But to save the world through him. He sent him. He had a job. And now people are trying to say, no, the Father dealt directly with the ancient Israelites of old. It was Jesus Christ that happened in the New Testament only. This is blasphemy. This is wrong. Because now you've got to turn around and say that Jesus Christ was a liar, and he wasn't. You have not seen his image or heard his voice. That's what's happening. This stuff happens. And then in verse 18 it says, Whoever believes in him, his role, his sacrifice, his reconciliation. Why was there a need for reconciliation? Reconciliation for what? Reconciliation to whom? To the Father. Because without that death, there was no reconciliation. How can God of the Father deal with the ancient Israelites when they were steeped in their sin? When he had to turn away from his own son, when his son represented that sin on the cross. And Jesus Christ said, Eloi, Eloi, Alama Sabachthani. Because he knew in that moment the Father had to turn away. And then there's a man coming along now telling us that the Father is dealing with ancient Israel, who were steeped in their sins before his son was even sacrificed, before this redemption even took place. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, the sins of the world were on him. Your sins. My sins. Now there's some man out there, there's a group of men trying to tell you that's not the case. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus, the mouth of Jesus Christ, certainly. <laughs> you got some big decisions to make. Some big decisions to make. <laughs> There's a lot riding on it. And how guilty are you if you're leading little ones down the path of destruction? How guilty are you? And how your guilt remains and doesn't sleep and stirs even now. Shame on you. Shame on you. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Actually, we'll just we'll go to Titus 1, verse 1. Let's start there. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of of the truth that leads to goodness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, right? Follow me. Which God, who does not lie, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. What does that mean? Read it. These are not my words. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and at his appointed season, at the right time, he brought his word to light. How? Through the preaching and trusted to me, which he received from the word, Christ, by the command of God, now he's calling it directly God, our Savior. He's God, and He's our Savior. Remember what we read in the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing has been made that has been made without it. And then we read in John chapter 114 how the Word became flesh. So you know who it's talking about. <coughs> What's so calling God your God and Savior? Right there. That's what the Apostle Paul understood. Titus 
right? Chapter 2, just further ahead here. And verse 9. Now this, we're just backing up the verse 9 to give it some context. That's all. Excuse me. It says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, right? Not to talk back to them, <clears throat> and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior, there it is again, attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All men. Old Testament, New Testament, all men. It teaches us to say no to the ungodliness and worldly passions that crave in our flesh, right? And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. In this present age, which is hard to do because we're bombarded with all kinds of crap, you know, about how we should look and, and, and the provocative things that come against us. I went this morning and I got this coffee and some donuts. And my wife and I went through the drive through and this older lady that we know there turned to us and she said, oh, hey, how's it going? I said, it's going fine. And uh, I said, oh, our grandchildren are coming to church. Oh, yeah. She said, you know, I love grandkids, but she said, I wouldn't want to be raising kids in this day and age. She said, my nine-year-old grandchild, he has a screen. And she said, you'd be amazed at what you could pull up on that screen. And he's only nine. She's a wise woman. She knows where she's standing. And you know where you're standing. Why is that? What kind of world is that going to produce? When they come of age, what are we standing in? All kinds of garbage is what we're standing in. And they pull at us. So we say no to the ungodliness and the worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, is my point. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. And they were his very own even when he liberated them from the Egyptians. They were his very own when he made Adam and Eve. A people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. And that's what we are, is we are this new nation, a kingdom of priests and kings. Living stones who offer our bodies, who offer our, our, the control over our impulses and urges as a living sacrifice to God. And it's hard. But we know we must do it because we know who we are being watched by, for God, the one who has redeemed us. So we have to we have to do this. We have no choice. To redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites, his people, is that they may be saved. And we know how that turned out for Paul. They wound up rejecting him, and he wound up going to the Gentiles. So that they may be saved, verse 2, for I can testify about them that yes, they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. They don't know. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, 
and they sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Because even though that law condemns you, there is one, like we read in 1 John, that turns to the Father when we fail, when we sin, and not willingly or on purpose. And he is our advocate, our, our defense. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Verse 5, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, You who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down. Or do not say in your heart, Who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are proclaiming. That if you confess your sins with your mouth, sorry, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, and that will also cause you to conduct yourself in a certain way, we just read that, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, Jesus Christ, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. <coughs> oh, excuse me. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? This is what we're facing right now. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how could they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. From the ancient Israelites, all the way through. But I ask, did they not hear? And Paul says, of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation, and I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Remember what it said just before about the word of Christ in verse 17. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. This is Jesus Christ that said those things. Period. That's what Paul just said. Did they not hear? Of course they had a chance. Of course they heard. You better believe they did. Ephesians 3, verse 9. Ephesians 3. So we'll back it up to verse 8 just to give it more context. So Ephesians 3 verse 8, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ 
and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Remember what Jesus said to Moses. In the past, I revealed myself as God, but now I'm revealing myself as the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So for ages past was hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, right, this body, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Remember how angels long to look into these things. According to his eternal purpose, his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. His eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus and in nobody else. In him and through him, sorry, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Why? Because we've been redeemed by His blood. And this redemptive action started right from the beginning, culminating to the point where He had to come to finish the Father's work that the Father had sent Him to finish, which they had both understood would be required right from the beginning of creation. So we may approach God with freedom and confidence because of this redemption only through Christ and through faith in Him. That's the only way we may approach God the Father. Does it make sense that the Father would approach us and then we read these scriptures? No, it doesn't. It's a lie. That's a lie. That's what this, these people are expecting others to believe. Why? And it blocks out, cuts out Jesus Christ. And God is saying, no, he's the only one. I have designated him to represent me. I cannot look at you and your sins. Those sins have to be paid for. And they were. By the one appointed to pay for them. Let me ask you a question. And I'll get into more of this next week. <coughs> When Jesus said to them, a new command I give you, what's he talking about? A new command I give you, to love one another the way that I have loved you. And by this love, the whole world will know that you are my disciples, that you truly are my disciples, if you have love for one another, if there's no absence of this. And they accepted it, because they accepted the one who was giving them a new command. A new command to add to what? The old commands. They knew who gave those commands. Because now he was giving them a new one. <coughs> and they accepted it. They knew to who they were talking to. <laughs> the one who had given the commands to Moses. A new command I give you. A new command I give you. Wow. <coughs> <coughs> and then Ephesians. Let's go back to Ephesians 1, verse 7. See, as we're right here. And we read this last week. Yep. And this was very descriptive of Christ's role. In him, we have redemption through his blood, only through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace and his plan that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, his plans, 
which he purposed in Christ. Now, how could someone come along and say, no, that's not the case? He purposed these plans and this wisdom and mystery and understanding of it all. He purposed them in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You heard this word of truth, and it became a vehicle, a way by which you were saved. Because it took root in your heart. You heard it. And the reason why you heard it was because you were predestined to hear it. He foreknew you to hear it. <coughs> and that doesn't happen right away. That's progressive. Bit by bit, piece by piece, we start to understand things. It doesn't happen overnight because it's too overwhelming. So you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed which is also a sign that you are who you are, special. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And that's what Jesus was saying in John chapter 17. <clears throat> that they belong to you, Father, and you gave them to me out of the world. And I revealed you to them, and they believed that you have sent me, and that I am your representative. Colossians. Just ahead here. Colossians, chapter 1. Now, again, I ask you, when you hear the narrative of all of these things combined, there's no way you can insert the Father before the Son. There's no way you can do it. Because now you've got to say that God and, and the, God the Father and the Son are both liars. I know better. And that's what's being said, that the Father dealt with ancient Israel. He didn't deal with nobody because they had sin. And it's not what the narrative is expressing. There's only one by which we are saved. There's only one mediator between God the Father and mankind. The one who was appointed to do so. The one who was appointed to do so by the Father. And when we were steeped in our sin, right, with the exception of a few, and those few we have the history of. They were prophets. They were the patriarchs. God worked with them. Jesus Christ worked with them even then. Just like Jesus Christ worked with them now. Only one mediator. New Testament, Old Testament. Only one mediator, only one being that dealt directly with mankind. And eventually came, when the time was right, to die for the sins of the world. And to redeem us back to the Father. So now we can approach the Father boldly. That's what it says. We can approach him boldly. Because we've been washed clean. By who? The only mediator that we've ever known. The one who was slain before the foundation of the world. The one who was predestined to wash us clean. It's very, very simple. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Now we read this last week, but I want to read this before I read the next scripture. And this is just amazing. Amazing. It just really puts it to bed. Verse 15, it talks about the supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. The invisible God. The part of the Godhead we don't see and haven't heard. The firstborn over all creation. Wow. <clears throat> For by him all things were created. Things in heaven 
and on earth, visible and invisible, he created. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, both physical and spiritual authorities, all things were created by him, and here it is, and for him. He is before all things. And this is what John the Baptist was saying. He that came after me was greater than me because he came before me. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Now you know who he's talking about. So that in everything he might have supremacy. And here is something amazing. And at the same time, if you go against it, it's condemning. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. And this is where people just suddenly go deaf. They don't hear it. Who has believed our testimony? Nobody. They rejected him. Listen to this. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. What does that mean? Making peace with what? With who? Making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And then I want you to go forward here to chapter 2 of Colossians, just ahead, verse 6. Now that we've read this, this is incredible. So when you insert the Father ahead of the Son, or when you say things that are not true, God was pleased to put the Son in this position for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And that's why he said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you ask me to show you the Father? How long have I been with you? <clears throat> Chapter 2, Colossians, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith, faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, and that's what's going on right here, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles or elemental principles of this world. And that's what people do to try and suck you in. They use your own reason and your own logic. That's why I'm telling you, don't believe any man, including myself. Read it for yourself. Or do you want to know? I think you should. See that no one takes you captive. By using human tradition and the basic principles of this wor world, rather than on Christ. And that's what's happened here. The focal point has shifted off of Jesus Christ. For in Christ... All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And we just read how God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Now this gives you more understanding of exactly what that is. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity, for us, lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness only in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised. Now he's talking about circumcision. And the one who gave that circumcision was the word, the logos, who pre-existed. And now he's tying that in with this duplicity or this type of fulfillment. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in putting off the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, 
But with the circumcision done by Christ, the circumcision of the heart, not not the extremities, or sorry, not uh, not the uh, uh, the Old Testament circumcision. Verse twelve, having been buried with him in baptism, and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, and that's how we were, in the Old Testament and the New, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins through Christ, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. <coughs> well, excuse me. He took it away. Nailing it to the cross. Our sins were nailed to the cross. Because Christ, Christ died for those sins once and for all. The world's religions believe, oh, the law is done away with. Well, then, what is sin then? The Bible tells you sin is the transgression of the law. Without the law, well, there's no sin. No. It wasn't the law that was nailed to the, Christ, uh, to the cross where Christ died. It was our sins that were nailed to the cross with his death. Because now we had a mediator. Now we had one who brought about our forgiveness for us. And when we fail, because we're human and we're fallible, Christ turns to the Father. That's what it says in 1 John. He turns to the Father on our behalf. I'm almost closing time here. Revelation 5. This is the supremacy of Christ. Someone is trying to do damage to that. And they're wrong. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. Then I saw in his right, the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Okay? A scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. And I wept, and I wept, because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, killed, standing in the center of the throne, and circled by the four living creatures and the elders. Oh. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came, and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God, all men and from every tribe and language and people and nation all men that had ever lived and all men that were to come you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth they will reign on the earth not in heaven. Not in heaven. They will reign on the earth. That's a story for another day. And then Galatians in closing here, chapter 3. Then we're done. I'm just getting this so that I can set up for next week. Galatians, chapter 3, verse 15. Brothers, let me take 
an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, you can't change your mortgage. You can't change a business contract. It's a contract that has been duly established. So it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people. <coughs> but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise who preceded the law. Because Abraham lived way before Moses. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come and fulfilled it. The law was put into effect through angels, by a mediator. It doesn't say anything about the Father. Imagine that. And we'll get into some of that more next week. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. And we'll leave it at that until next week, where we'll get more into the Old Testament and more into these scriptures that support who Jesus Christ was, our only mediator. Thank you.